as I said, the place where we're going to begin is talking about um, the why of evangelism or the, the, the motivation for evangelism, because I, I take it this morning that, uh, though, that uh, as you come here, uh, I mean, you've come along to an evangelism workshop, so I'm assuming that means that you, uh, you, you, you think that evangelism is important and um, that you you think that you should be doing it and you want to do it and you want to do it better. So in that sense, uh, I may be preaching to the converted a little bit here, um, but I still think that it's possible to be convinced that evangelism is, is, is important and know that we should do it. And yet uh, we still uh, don't prioritize it or, or, or we don't get around to doing it. And so we need to be reminded of the why um, because that will really help us uh, with, uh, with the what as, uh, and the how. So let me uh, share my slides here, and I want to get, uh, get us thinking. You'll see in the notes there's a few activities to get us thinking about how we should do, uh, do evangelism. So uh, there's a number of questions here, and uh, one I, I'll just go through them one by one. And uh, I just want you to think, you know, is it, do you think this is true or... Or false, and uh, we're going to come back to these at, at at the end. Okay, so the first one: God commands every Christian to share the gospel. Is that true or false? Uh, get out a piece of paper, something, write it down, uh, commit to an answer. God commands every individual Christian to share the gospel. True or false? Uh, you can only share the gospel when you're a mature Christian. You know, like a leader or a pastor or something like that. Um, you don't need to speak to share the gospel. You can witness to Christ through your actions. Is that, is that true or is that false? Uh, social action is a form of evangelism. True or false? The best way to share the gospel is through evangelistic rallies. Uh, we know that those are quite popular in our part of the world. Uh, okay, over the page. Uh, you must be friends with someone before sharing the gospel. True or false? God gives some people, especially as evangelists. Evangelism is only for ministers. And the last one, because God is sovereign, it's sufficient to pray and not share the gospel. Uh, well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually give you a preview of the answers here. And you can, uh, we will come back to this at the end, but I think it's probably helpful for you to, to know where I stand. <laughs> and that will hopefully also prompt you to ask some questions. I should say that at the start. Please do ask questions, use the chat, drop questions in the chat, or you can just private message them to, uh, to Tim Phillips if you want to remain uh, anonymous, um, uh, because that'd be really good if we can engage in that way. So let's think, oh, so God commands every individual to, Christian to share the gospel. I would argue that's true. Uh, you can only share the gospel when you're a mature Christian. Uh, false, right? You don't need to speak to share the gospel. You can witness Christ through your actions. I would argue that that is false um, you must speak uh, social action is a form of evangelism i would argue that that is false uh, the best way to share the gospel is through evangelistic rallies uh, i'd argue that that is false as well not to say that rallies are you know are wrong or anything like that but it's the best the best word there um, you must be friends with someone before sharing the gospel uh, I'm going to argue that that's ideal, that you are friends with someone, but uh, the answer is false. Um, God gives someone, some people, especially as evangelists. Uh, I'm going to argue that that is true, right? um, even though we're all called. Some people are uh, especially gifted. Um, evangelism is only for ministers, false. Uh, and because God is sovereign, it's sufficient to pray and not share the gospel. I'm also going to argue false for that. So, um, I hope that stimulates your thinking and, and, and perhaps helps you to ask some questions later on. Second activity, just to warm us up this morning. Uh, what are your biggest fears in sharing 
the gospel, one of your biggest fears. I'm going to just, you know, jot down um, a couple of things. Maybe you can drop some answers in the chat. What are your biggest fears uh, in sharing the gospel? Um, would, any, would anyone like to share an answer? Either out loud or in the chat? Yeah, great. Thanks for those who've written in the chat. So yeah, feeling of being rejected or being viewed negatively by others. I think that's a big one. I feel that, um, especially when we're talking to friends or, or family, isn't it? We're, we're often worried, you know, if I, if I say, look, you know, unless you turn to Jesus, um, you know, this is going to happen. Um, yeah, we're worried that they'll be offended, that they won't be as friendly to us as they were before, or even they might reject us. That's, that's hard. Yeah. Um, being challenged yeah so you try and share your faith and then they say oh yeah but what about this question you know what about that question that can be off-putting argumentative people right yeah so some people might be quite passionate or aggressive in their response that's it's never nice I, we do live in a culture right where we like to you know show face we like to get along with people we like to have you, you, you uh, be at peace with people and so this can be most uncomfortable for many of us, isn't it? It really does push us out of our comfort zone because a lot of people are not that happy to hear um, the gospel preached to them. Uh, how to begin? Yeah, I think that's a, that, that, that's a challenging one as well. Um, yeah, so we don't know how to begin, so we, we just don't start, or it just, just feels too awkward to, to change the conversation. Um, yeah, don't know how to answer questions. Uh, that's also a big one as well. If, we, if you're not confident, you know, you don't want to share, share the wrong thing or you, you don't want to, you know, lead them astray, then that also can, uh, can be difficult. So we have a lot of fears. We have, there are a lot of challenges um, in, in, in sharing the gospel. And, and I think very often that can just lead us to not do it um, or not be bold in doing it. Um, I know that, that uh, that's the case for me. It's, it's, it's often not very difficult for me to turn the conversation to the gospel because when someone meets me for the first time, you know, they ask, oh, yeah, so, you know, what, what, what do you do? And I say, well, I work in a church. <laughs> so it's, uh, you know, it, it's not very hard to, I mean, they're, they're almost forced to talk about uh, religion and Christianity at, 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 that, at that point. But uh, still there's, the, you know, there is the fear there or, uh, am I going to be bold in actually sharing or, or, or not? So one more, one more activity, uh, one more third question here. When is the last time you had a gospel conversation? You know, was it this morning at breakfast? Was it last week? Was it a month ago? Was it a year or more? Um, you don't have to put this in the chat. This is a personal question, but it's helpful to think, well, when is when is the last when is the last time and um, if it's been a long time then um, maybe this today will be a good encouragement for you to um, to, to, to reprioritize this um, this again okay so let's let's dive in then and uh, where our, our topic today is is strategic evangelism and I thought it's helpful to begin maybe by saying what it is and what it is not because right? people and churches have all kinds of ideas about uh, how we should go about evangelism. And I think this might also just, start, just clarify things and maybe raise some questions for us. So firstly, uh, strategic evangelism is not changing the message to make it more attractive. Uh, see, we've just shared in, the, in, our, in our sharing that sometimes when we want to uh, our fears in sharing the gospel is that we don't want to be rejected, we don't want to pin people, these kind of things. And so the temptation is often, therefore, to change the message or soften the message in order to make it more attractive um, to people. Yeah. So, so for example, um, maybe we talk about how God loves you. He's going he's gonna to bless you. He'll never abandon you, etc. cetera. Uh, so we talk about those, you know, more positive elements of the gospel, but we leave out ones that might be less attractive, like we don't talk about sin or God's judgment or, 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 or things like that, right? Uh, strategic evangelism is not 
making false promises to attract hearers. So an example of this, you know, with prosperity teaching, if you believe in Jesus, you know, God's going to prosper your life. You know, you, you'll be healthy, you, you'll be wealthy, um, you'll overcome um, the, the, the challenges in your life. Uh, you know, become a Christian, God's going to, um, going to prosper you. Um, that's not strategic evangelism because that's not true. You know, it's, it's, it's not the gospel. You, but with these kind of things where you change the message, um, or you make false promises like this, it's actually very easy to uh, gather a crowd. Um, if you tell people what they want to hear, it's very easy to gather a crowd. But And you might uh, think, oh, I'm doing great because my, my church has got so many people coming and there's, you, you know, it's growing. And um, But there's a difference between the true conversion, someone who's really turned to Christ through the true gospel, and someone who's been brought in by, um, by, by a, a false or distorted, um, distorted message. Um, so strategic evangelism is not that. Uh, it's not offering people self-help. Um, and here I'm thinking of, you know, the kind of Joel Osteen or Joyce Meyer kind of thing, or, or you know, saying you, you can become a Christian, you can be, be a better person, you can be happier. Um, uh, we're not here just to help people to be better people, although, of course, the gospel will transform us into better people. Um, but the goal is actually to see people saved from, um, from sin and living for the glory of Christ. It's not treating people as projects. And, um, I guess you see this somewhat in, uh, say, for example, in cults, right? So, uh, you know, you have a, a, a Mormon or Jehovah's Witness or whatever who, who, who comes up to you and, 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 you know, and they'll be very zealous in trying to convert you to, you know, what they believe um, God is like. Um, but the motivation for that is, it's not ultimately driven by love because in those cults, they're being taught that, uh, that they essentially have to do this, they have to go on these uh, missionary activities as part of earning, meriting um, salvation. So they're not really doing it because they love you and they, they, they want you to be saved, but it's more, it's ultimately selfish. You know, they're doing it to earn brownie points to, to get to heaven. And so we must be very aware of this. We, we're not here to... Um, it, to, to, to do it to just because we have a duty, we've been told to make disciples, and so we're, we're just going to do it, but we don't really care for people. Um, that's not strategic evangelism. It's not effective generally anyway, because um, you won't listen generally to someone who doesn't love you or care for you. Um, it's not manipulating people's emotions um, to get a response. So sometimes you see this in the bigger rallies or, or in some churches as well. It's very easy to create an environment that uh, can 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 uh, make a response. So, say for example, you play the right you know play the right music, or you create the right atmosphere, or the, these kinds of things. You you can actually manipulate emotions with these things to um, ha have someone make a response. But the thing is, it it, it probably won't. A response like that may not last the test of time. You know, you might have the rally and have 200 people come up the front and, you know, give their lives to Christ, but they may not have been really converted. Um, and it may be later on, like the parable of the, the soils talks about some on the path, uh, some on the rocky ground, some among the thorns, some in the, the, the good seed. So it may be that um, they, they seem like they, that they've grown, like the, 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 so, the, the seed on the rocks. But when persecution comes or trouble or desires of the world, you, you find that they don't last the test of time because they haven't been truly converted um, at, at that time. It's not about finding a golden bullet uh, program that will grow my church. I think a lot of churches do this, especially if you're maybe a smaller church. You think, oh, okay, what, what's the mega church down the road doing um, that is, you know, drawing in all the people? You know, do, do they have a particular program they're using? And if we just use that program, uh, it's you know, our church is going to grow um, like theirs. And we're certainly not, uh, you know, promoting that this morning with Christianity Explored. I think Christianity Explored is, is a wonderful and great resource. And I'm going to argue that it's going to be really helpful for your for use in, in, in your church. But it's not as simple as saying, okay, you, you just use Christianity Explored and then suddenly your church is going to have, uh, you know, 1,000 people in it um, next month. It's, there's more to it than that. Um, 
uh, it's not about uh, it's not an optional extra only for committed Christians uh, or, or, or leaders. It's something for, for all Christians. So that's 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 the is not. Uh, let's think about what it is, and uh, then we'll unpack this a bit more. It's biblically faithful, right? So it's it's practiced according to God's commands in Scripture. That not only about the message. So uh, we preach the gospel message that's taught in the Scriptures. But we also share that gospel message in the way that the scriptures tell us to do. Uh, so it's biblically faithful, both the message and the manner. Uh, it's motivated by love. Right? It, we genuinely care for um, the person and their needs, um, uh, not just their salvation, but, but, but uh, their physical needs as well. Uh, it's contextualized and, and wise. So, so it's packaged in a way that is sensitive to the culture and the people um, that we're trying to reach. We're not, we're not changing the gospel message, but uh, we're, we're just recognizing, well, what is the particular, um, particular struggles or whatever of these people? So for example, right, Malaysia is a multicultural society. We're doing this seminar today in English, but we know actually that most Christians in Malaysia are not in English speaking churches, they're in Chinese speaking churches or BM speaking churches. I'll show you some statistics a bit later on about that. Um, and, and so if you're trying to reach Christians in Malaysia, you don't just do it in English, right? You, you, you translate, you, you do it in Chinese, you do it in, in BM, you do it in Tamil or uh, whatever language they speak if they're from another country, right? So uh, it's contextualized and wise. Um, in, in that sense, you're not changing the message, right? But you're thinking about who are the people that I'm that I'm trying to trying to reach. Yeah. Um, it's every Christian's priority, right? So it's it's something that we should all be personally invested in uh, and involved in. Uh, it's soaked in prayer because we recognize God is sovereign, and the fruit ultimately comes from Him. So we're prayerful, and it's it's made effective by the convicting word of the Spirit. Through the word. I want to say that up front, um, the Holy Spirit is very important to evangelism. It's the Holy Spirit that changes the heart, but it's the Holy Spirit that changes the heart through the word, right? As we share, faithfully share, um, share the gospel, we shouldn't separate the Holy Spirit uh, from the word, uh, from the word of God. So uh, I hope that uh, shows us a little bit about where, what it is and what it is not. And uh, if you'd like to ask any questions, feel free to, uh, to drop it in the chat and uh, before, we, before we move on. Any, any questions so far, Tim? Uh, we're no questions yet, but if anyone has a question they wanna drop into the chat, they're welcome to. Or if you want to just ask directly, uh, just unmute your mic and ask Tim directly, that's fine. Okay, if not, we'll keep going. Uh, time is short, so we will definitely make the most of it. But please do ask. I would love us, I would love us to do that. So let's think about God's mission then. Uh, so we're going to think about God's mission and our mission, God's heart, and then our heart. Uh, so God's, uh, God's mission. Uh, and that word for mission, uh, it, uh, our English word mission comes from a Latin word, missio, which means to send. Um, and that uh, derives from the Greek and uh, the Greek words, um, which also mean to send. So mission is about uh, sending people out um, to preach to preach the gospel uh, so that they may be, may be saved. Let's just do a brief, brief overview from Genesis to Revelation um, to get uh, a sense of, of, of God's, God's mission. So we start at the beginning. Uh, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Um, the point here is that God made the whole world. He didn't just make, you know, Malaysians or, uh, or uh, Chinese people or Indians or, or whatever. He, he made everyone, right? And, uh, and God's concern is for the whole, is for the whole world. Uh, and so after the fall uh, into sin, God makes these important uh, promises to Abraham. And among the promises, he says, I will, I will bless those who bless you him who dishonors you, I will curse, and in you all the families of the earth 
shall be blessed. So the Old Testament, of course, from this point on, it's very focused on the nation of Israel, God's, God's people. But this verse is important because it shows us that God hasn't lost his concern for the nations, right? God's plan is that, that through Israel, the gospel will ultimately go to the world. And we see different glimpses of that along the way as different Gentiles are, are, are joined to the people of God, like, like Rahab and Ruth and um, or, or Jonah going to the Assyrians and so on. God's heart is always for the nation. It's just because God chose Israel in the Old Testament, the point ultimately was uh, to, reach, uh, to reach the world. Uh, so I see, similar, see a similar thing in Exodus 19. God saves his people from Egypt. He brings them to Mount Sinai. And he says in uh, Exodus 19, you yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians, how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now, therefore, if you indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among all peoples, for all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words you shall speak to the people of Israel. So once again, you can see here Israel chosen as God's, God's special possession. Right? But God also says that the whole world is his, and Israel's mission is to be a kingdom of priests, and a holy nation. A priest is, is, a, is a mediator between God and people. Right? So Israel is to be a kingdom of priests. You know, as a nation, their role is to make God known to the world, um, to the nations. Uh, and of course, Israel fails miserably in, 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 the, in that mission rather than um, you know, honoring God's name among the nations, of course, they fall into idolatry and, and, and to sin, and, and, in, and in, in God's name is blasphemed among the nations. But this was Israel's mission. This was what they were called, uh, called to do. Uh, Psalm 2, we see that uh, uh, the Messiah is promised in the Old Testament is to rule over the nations and to save the nations. So Psalm 2, this is uh, uh, God, the Son of God speaking. I will tell of the decree the Lord said to me, you are my son, today I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will make the nations your heritage, the ends of the earth your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron and bash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. So God's promised king would rule over all the nations. Uh, and he wouldn't only rule over all the nations, but he would also bring salvation to the nations. So Isaiah 49 talks about the suffering servant. I think often at Easter time, we read Isaiah 53, which is also about the suffering servant, how he died to save people. Well, this is another one of those servant songs. And uh, God says of his servant here, it's too light a thing you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and bring back to the preserve of Israel. I will make you as a light for the nations that my salvation may reach to the ends of the earth. So God's servant would die and rise, not only to bring salvation to Jews, but ultimately to bring salvation uh, to, uh, to all the world. And, and the way that he would do that um, is, is by dying, uh, dying and rising. And, and, and that's hinted at even in Isaiah 52 and 3 itself, right? Uh, as many were astonished at you, his appearance was so marred beyond human semblance, his form beyond that of the children of mankind. This is why we call him the suffering servant, because he suffers at God's hand. But it says, verse 15, so he shall sprinkle many nations. Uh, kings shall shut their mouths because of him. For that which they've not been told, they see. That which they've not heard, they understand. See, the point of his suffering is salvation goes to the world. Now, as we fast forward uh, to the New Testament, of course, Christ is the one who ultimately fulfills um, all of these um, uh, prophecies. And so the risen Lord Jesus says to his uh, disciples, Luke 24, these are my words I spoke to you while I'm still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. He opened their minds to understand the scriptures. And he said to them, thus it is written, that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead, for example, Isaiah 53, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins should, must, has to be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from 
Jerusalem. And that's exactly what we see as we go into the, uh, to the book of Acts. Um, Jesus commissions the disciples, Acts 1.8, you are going to be my witnesses, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends, uh, to the ends of, of the earth. And that mission is ongoing now. Um, um, the gospel has gone to many nations. It's even come to us um, here in Malaysia. Um, but ultimately, that mission is going to be completed. And we see that at the end in, in the book of, of Revelation. After this, I looked, behold, a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands, crying out with a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. So on that glorious final day, uh, the nations will be gathered around um, the Lord Jesus, singing his praises, wearing the white robes, they've been saved from their sins. Um, that's where it's all headed. And, and the, all those promises from the Old Testament will be fulfilled in uh, in entirety. So I hope uh, my, my point here is that uh, mission is a major theme of the whole Bible. Uh, I, in a sense, mission is why the Bible exists at all, really. Uh, I, I mean, God reveals himself, he sends his son because he wants to save the nations for himself, for his praise and glory. Uh, that's, that's why we're here. Um, God wants to be glorified as the gospel goes, uh, goes to the world. Um, so what is mission in the end? This is a, this is a definition that I got from Mike Rader. He's, he served as a missionary for I think more than two decades in, in Pakistan. Um, and he writes this. Mission in the New Testament refers to the verbal proclamation of the gospel, to the end that people are converted and mature churches are planted and established. The goal, this goal is achieved as the gospel of salvation, which is found in Jesus Christ, is proclaimed and the word of God is taught. And that definition is really important. It's really, it's essential that we understand what's being said here. Right? Mission is about the verbal proclamation of the gospel. I mean, the gospel, the word gospel means good news. Right? It's a message to be proclaimed. And so in that sense, you can't, uh, evangelize or evangelism means to preach the gospel unless you open your mouth and speak it right? so i don't know if you've heard that uh, that famous kind of uh, saying uh, you know share the gospel preach the gospel use words where where necessary and uh and so people are saying look you know live a be a kind person be a loving person witness to christ through your actions and um, you know, you don't need to say anything. They'll just be able to observe your life and, and, and God will bring them, uh, bring them to Christ. And of course, there is, a, there is an element of truth in this statement. And, and, and that is, um, our lives are really important. And many people do come to know Christ um, or, or they're drawn to Christ through our lives of love. And Jesus says in John 13, by this Will all men know that you are my disciples by your love for one another? So, yes, our lives as Christians are very significant. Our, in particular, our love for one another. Um, it does make the gospel attractive to those around us. But until we actually open our mouth and speak the gospel and tell them about Jesus, we haven't done evangelism. We haven't shared the gospel. Uh, Think about it this way. I mean, if you just live a good life, then what will the, what will the friends conclude? They'll say, oh, Tim Phillips is a nice person. He's a very kind person. Um, they'll, they'll give the glory to Tim rather than giving it to, to, to Jesus, you see. Yeah. Um, they might say, oh, I want to be like that so I can become a better person. But it's an, a, another thing entirely to say, look, no, I need to be forgiven. And Jesus is the Lord of my life. 
someone is not going to arrive at that unless uh, unless we speak it okay well let's uh, let's go on and uh, we'll think about now god's heart uh and uh and our heart and our mission right so we've thought about god's mission now let's think about god's heart uh, and i've got three passages here uh, which i think really highlight um this well so jonah chapter four remember the story of jonah jonah tries to run away because he doesn't want um the assyrians to be saved and he gets eaten by the fish and you know uh, god forces him to go back and to preach to the ninevites and they repent and are saved and jonah's very unhappy about this and that's what jonah chapter four is about um we read in verse 10 the lord said you pity the plant for which you did not labor nor did you make it grow which came into being in the night and perished in the night and should not i pity nineveh that great city in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know their right hand from their left and also much cattle so do you see god's heart here god looks at nineveh so it's a wicked city they deserve destruction but god's heart is that they would be saved um and that's why it goes to so much effort to send jonah to them so that they would repent um it makes us reflect on our own heart i mean ko um some many of us would be from ko okay seven and a half million people there are relatively more christians in ko than most parts of malaysia as we'll see um but whether you're from penang malacca johor singapore wherever you're from there are hundreds of thousands millions of people who have not yet turned to the lord jesus god looks on them um with great um, pity and, and compassion uh john 3:16 God so loved the world he gave his only son whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life for god did not send his son into the world to condemn the world but in order that the world might be saved through him so god loves the world even though the world's in rejection of him um he sends his son to be to be crucified that the world might be saved Uh, Luke 15 is a good example. Uh, we had time we could read the full thing of the prodigal son um, and, and, and see the you know, father welcoming the wayward son back and so on. Uh, but the, the, the parable just before that, uh, what man of you having a hundred sheep, if he's lost one of them, does not leave the 99 in the open country and go after the one that is lost until he finds it. And when he's found it, he lays it on his shoulders rejoicing. Just so I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 persons who need no repentance god loves every single sinner god rejoices um, when one comes to him uh, and 2 peter 3 do not overlook this one fact beloved that with the lord one day is as a thousand years and a thousand years is as a day the lord is not slow to fulfill his promise as some count slowness but is patient towards you not wishing that any should perish but that all should reach repentance I and mean, why is it that jesus has been away for 2000 years and not returned yet i mean in one sense he's only been away for a weekend according to this it's not you know it's not exactly a long time on god's time scale but um he hasn't come back because when jesus comes back everyone who's not trusted in jesus is going to perish and that's billions of people um so jesus is has not returned yet um to give us more time to share the gospel with our non-christian family friends colleagues classmates and so on um so that they can be saved from this um, awful judgment uh, that is to come so that's uh, that's god's heart and uh, uh, i think it's helpful to think on god's heart that our own heart may be may be stirred to want what god wants to
Now I've been talking for a little while. I think it'd be helpful if we have a little bit of a, uh, an activity at this point. So uh, I want us to think about our mission. Uh, we're going to have a look at, uh, at the Great Commission from Matthew 28. If you've got your Bible, please do open it there. And I've, I've, I've just got uh, four questions here. Uh, maybe, Tim, you can pass me the host for a moment. So, I can have uh, so why must we make disciples? Who should make disciples? Who must we make disciples of? And how must we make disciples, right? So why, why, who, who, and how? Um, you find the questions in the book if you, uh, in, the, in the notes if you need to. So let's divide into groups. And uh, if you have time, uh, there you can look at the other, um, you know, the other commissioning passages from, uh, as you can have a look at, at John or Romans or some of the other passages as well. I don't think you have time, but just try and do the, the, the Great Commission one first. Okay, all right, so there is no breakout rooms enabled, Tim. So, <laughs> so I'm gonna give you uh, uh, some time to do this in your uh, individually then, okay? So uh, I'll put the questions on the screen again. And uh, what I want you to do is just take, yeah, take five minutes or so uh, to read through that passage and, uh, and, and see if you can answer those, uh, answer those questions.
okay, let's uh, let's go through it uh, together and check our answers. So the first one was about uh, why must we make uh, disciples? So Jesus came to them, verse 18, and says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples disciples of all nations so the reason why we make disciples of all nations is because jesus has been raised as lord of all you know it's not that there's you know one god for one nation and another god for another nation you know, jesus is the lord of all nations um, all authority is given to him and therefore he deserves the worship um, the praise the submission of all the nations so that's the first one. The second one, who should make disciples? Uh, and the answer here is that it's, it, it's all Christians make disciples, right? So, so he says, go and go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them and teaching them everything, um, I, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And notice who this command is addressed to. He's talking to the 11 disciples so he says to the 11 disciples go and make disciples right and teach those disciples to observe everything i've commanded including i take it this command um, to make disciples so disciples make disciples who make disciples who make disciples and the fact that this extends beyond the 11 you can see at the end because he says i'm with you always to the end of the age right so he's, he's looking beyond the lifetime of the disciples here uh so yeah it's it, this is something that all christians are commanded to do sometimes they people say oh this was just for the apostles and therefore it's only really you know christian leaders who have to do this no all christians if we are disciples it is our mission to make disciples yes who do we make disciples of um all nations right um so it's not uh it doesn't say make disciples of those only who are easy to reach or only those who are safe to reach or only those who um are interested in the gospel make disciples of all nations without exception um how do we make disciples uh well it talks about baptizing so it's um, bringing in new believers and then uh, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. So the mission, according to the Great Commission, is uh, includes discipleship. So it's not just getting people to become Christians, but it's about growing people to maturity um, in Christ as well. Yeah. Okay, so you can have a look at what the other passages say if we had time, but uh, I think for now we'll just we'll, we'll move on and uh, we'll have a have a break in about 15 minutes so the summary so far we'll just skip these other passages we've seen that god's saving plan is the overarching message of the bible uh, the mission of jesus is at the center of that plan uh, jesus accomplishes that mission through his death and resurrection right, as the servant king uh, we've seen that uh, Jesus sends his witnesses to continue his mission. So it's, in a sense, it's, it's Jesus' mission, in other words. It's God's mission. It's Jesus' mission. It becomes our, it becomes our mission. We can see that in uh, the John 20 passage, actually, I, which I skipped just now. Uh, it's, Jesus says uh, here, as the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. Right? So the Father's on a mission. He sent his son. And the son is continuing his mission through his people. So Jesus sends his witnesses to continue his mission. Um, mission leads to the formation of churches, believers who are brought to maturity in Christ. Um, and and uh, the goal ultimately is the worship of God in the new creation. So that's, uh, that, that's what, we've, uh, what we've seen um, so far in terms of our mission. Um, our mission is to be God's mission. God's mission is to be our mission. Uh, and also I want to argue that God's heart ought to be our heart um, as, as well. Um, so we see that uh, that heartbeat of Paul in 2 Corinthians 5, he says this, 
Therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade others. The fear of the Lord here is talking about how we're all going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. We're all going to give an account of how we've used our lives. So knowing that you will give an account to Jesus for your life, well, of course, as we persuade others. Um, but it's not only the fear of the Lord that drives Paul, knowing that he has to give an account to Jesus for his life, but it's also the love of God. Right? Um, uh, so he says in verse 14, the love of Christ controls us. We've concluded this, that one died for all, therefore all died. He died for all, that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him before their sake died and was raised. So the love of Christ um, drove Paul because he knew that Jesus died to rescue us. Our lives is no longer ours. They belong to him. And that because they belong to him, um, we should bring all people um, to, 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 to live for him. And so he doesn't look at people the same anymore. He says, from now on, we, we regard no one according to the flesh. We don't just look at people, the outside thing. Are they a doctor or a nurse or a teacher? Are they old or young, male or female? Those are not the categories with which Paul is now viewing people. Um, he is not looking at people through the flesh. He says, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. The new has come. So have they been reborn? Have they received salvation, the new birth, or are they still in the darkness? Those are the categories um, for Paul. And I think it's, but I think it is hard for us to keep this in our minds. I mean, we we work with people, we drive along the road, we look around, or we're eating our breakfast this morning. Maybe there's other people around us in the mama or wherever we were, and we might think, oh, we might notice things about them, about oh, how many kids do they have, or whatever. Um, maybe it's only me who does people watching. I don't know, um, but. I think it's easy to become desensitized and think, you know, is this person headed for heaven or are they headed for hell? Are they saved or are they not? Um, but those are the categories in which the Apostle Paul looked um, at, at people, driven by the fear of the Lord, the love of Christ. He sought to persuade, to speak, that others would come to this. To this new birth so it's it's uh, it's worth asking then uh where is your heart at uh do you truly share god's heart for the lost are you truly convicted of the truth of the gospel do you truly desire god's glory with your life and of course if we're honest um we, we never do as much as we should yeah and my, my goal is not really for us to feel guilty or anything like that but um, it's, it's more of a, just an encouragement, exhortation again. Look how wonderful God's heart for the lost is, how wonderful his mission. And, and that ought to be our heartbeat as well. So just for the last few minutes here, I thought it's helpful to um, revisit the state of uh, uh, evangelization in the world and here in Malaysia and, uh, and, and let, that, let those numbers, I guess, move us to think about what we will do with our lives. Um, so let's start with the world uh, world evangelization, uh, and so if I can click forward here, yeah. Uh, so here's some of you know just a few countries that I that I pulled out. I think of uh, Joshua Project. So Malaysia, uh, obviously majority Islam, nine percent Christians, uh, thirty one percent unreached. That means less than five percent of that people group is Christian. So. One third of people groups in Malaysia are unreached. Yeah. Uh, Singapore, obviously, there's, there's, a, there's quite a few more Christians in Singapore than Malaysia, but it's still quite a low percentage overall. Um, China, 1.34 billion people, 83% um, unreached. That's a lot of people who don't know the Lord Jesus. But percentage wise, you can go down and have a look at Iraq. 1%, Japan, 1%, there's 133 million people in Japan. India, a billion people, 5% Christian, 91% unreached. Um, and then you know, Algeria, Thailand, 
even Australia, where I'm from, theoretically, <laughs> there's 69 percent call themselves Christian on the census. But of course, we know that that's really not uh, not at all the case. It's far less than 10 percent of people would be in a church on a Sunday. Um, uh, so there's a lot of people. I wonder how you feel as you just um, read this table and. It's, it's helpful to remember that these are just not just numbers, but every, these numbers represent real people you know, who have families and their own ambitions and desires and struggles, and worries, um, billions of them that, that don't know the Lord Jesus. Um, what about Malaysia? Oh, sorry, before we get to Malaysia, this is a Operation Well, this is a world religion. So uh, the blue is uh, Christianity. You can see it's the only truly global religion in that sense. Um, uh, Muslims is the, the, the green, Buddhist is, is yellow, a lot of that in Southeast Asia, um, Hindus mainly in India, and then um, non-religious is, is, is mainly in China. Uh, so uh, there's the top 10 unevangelized countries, most of them are in Southeast Asia. Um, Malaysia is not included in that, but it's surrounded by them. Uh, Two thirds of the world's population lives in Asia, but only one fifth of Christians. Um, you can see most of the world's Muslims, atheists, Buddhists, and Hindus live in Asia and are therefore unreached. This is on our doorstep. 86% um, of the world's Muslims, Hindus, and Buddhists do not personally know Christian. I'm not saying they haven't heard the gospel, that means they, they, they don't even know a single Christian person. If that's the case, how could they become Christians? I mean, I guess they could go on the internet and, you know, go to bible.com or whatever and be converted that way. But um, we all know how important it is to hear it from a real living Christian. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, that, I think they're very um, confronting things to just to see and just realize just how many people don't yet know Christ, especially in our part of the world. Uh, Malaysia itself, 32 million, 75% live in cities, um, and the population is increasing by a thousand people per day. So even just to maintain um, the percentage of Christians here, imagine how many churches we need to plant every single day, you know, um, obviously not meeting that. Uh, so, What's the breakup in terms of uh, of, of who's, who, who's who? So, uh, sixty percent of Christians are BM speaking, twenty six percent Chinese, four percent Indian, and then you know other rest people like me. Um, so that's interesting, isn't it? Um, because a lot of us. Uh, probably from English speaking churches, I guess. In terms of the states, you can see most Christians are in Sabah and Sarawak. Um, most of the other states have got very low numbers of, uh, of, of Christians. Um, the lowest, blunt, and 0.28%. I mean, it, you'd be hard pressed to meet another Christian um, in, 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 in blunt. Um, so, uh, you know, religion, so there's 20, 20 million Muslims, 5 million uh, Buddhists, 2 million, about 3 million Christians, 2 million Hindus, and, and, and then not, not many uh, uh, atheists, non-religious in Malaysia, but there are some. So about 9.4% of Christians. And in terms of the trend, um, so this is... I might need to get a new graph soon. <laughs> this graph is almost uh, falling off the edge. Um, but uh, the general trend is that Islam is growing, Christianity is growing, and the other religions is being, is, is being squeezed out. Um, yeah. So I think there's a, there's a, there's a challenge to us um, in terms of um, mission in Malaysia as well. You know, um, how, how will we use our lives to reach out to many around us? We don't know Christ. Um, Alan Cole was a, was a missionary in Malaysia um, in the 1950s. Uh, he, uh, he went to the New Villages and um, 
and uh, he, you know, he, he could, he was, he was one of the great men of God. I mean, he, he could speak um, not only, uh, you know, Greek, Hebrew, Arame Aramaic, um, but he could speak Mandarin, Cantonese, Hokkien. Uh, he would have his Greek New Testament and preach in Hokkien. I mean, he was, he was an unbelievable man of God. So he was a great scholar. He's, some of you would maybe have even read some of the commentaries that he wrote while he was in the New Villages. Um, uh, but here was a man with great academic ability, um, went on to be a great seminary lecturer, um, but his heart was for the nations. He went to, to the New Villages. Um, so he wrote this in one of his articles. Is it nothing to you, you that pass by? Is it nothing to you that millions sit in darkness and in the shadow of death or the light has dawned for you? And I, I've always found that to be a profoundly challenging Well, We have salvation, we have eternal life. Um, and yet so often, we're more just worried about our own comfort or just being rejected or whatever, while people are going to eternal destruction. Um, it, uh, it's profoundly challenging, I find personally. Uh, I, I hope you feel, uh, you feel the same. So I think it's probably time to wrap up for this, this session, but uh, let me just leave you with a few more questions to ponder. Um, do I regularly pray for the salvation of others? Do I give money for the spread of the gospel? Do I know about the state of the church overseas or here in Malaysia? Who have I been trying to share the gospel with? Um, have I been uh, going to training to equip to share the gospel? I guess you can tick that one now because you're here. <laughs> um, but these kind of questions help to get at where our heart is at and how important um, the mission is um, to us. So you can take away these questions later on. You can you can also ask these ones, do you personally feel you share God's heart for the lost? Um, if the gospel is really true, how will that transform your attitude to evangelism? Who around you right now could you be sharing the gospel with? <clears throat> Make a list and start praying for them. Um, and, and you'll also find an article from John Piper in, um, in, in the appendix, which, which I'd encourage you to read um, in, as well. Uh, also very challenging. So, yeah, so God wants us to speak the gospel of Christ to other people that they may be saved. Um, and so we want to pray that we will share God's mission, share God's heart, and he will use us and our churches to bring the gospel uh, to others. Let me just say a short prayer and then uh, I'll pass back to Titi. Heavenly Father, um, we thank you, Lord, that you are a God of steadfast love. Thank you that you sent your son to save the world. Father, we pray that you would help us to share your heart, share your mission, that you would uh, enable us to go out of our comfort zone, to reach the many, many people who still sit in the darkness. Lord, help us not to keep the light to ourselves. Um, move us, Lord, we pray, to do something radical with our lives. And for we know one day we will give account to you of how we have Lord we want to see many many more gathered on that last day mm. around your throne giving you the praise that you so deserve so we pray all this in Jesus Amen. brilliant thank you uh, so much Tim for that helpful and uh, challenging uh, overview of the right motivations that we should be holding to as as brothers and sisters in Christ in in our evangelism and I certainly learned uh, some new things particularly in terms of those stats at the end as well they do come as quite a surprise but they're really helpful to know those things and that they might spur us on in our in our mission work uh, as Tim mentioned we're going to be taking a break in a moment. Before we do that, I just want to screen a short video uh, to help us see how uh, this resource that we uh, are just presenting today, Hope Explored, the, the convictions that we've been looking at, uh, that they hopefully, as you'll see, shine through uh, the thinking behind and the reason for why we have written and we want to share this resource with the church, uh, which is Hope Explored. So just watch the video uh, for a couple of minutes. Hope Explored 
is a three session series about the person and work of Jesus and the hope that's found in him. Many people in the world today are living without hope. They've seen their hopes dashed or disappointed, but we believe that there is real and lasting hope in the world and that that hope is found in Jesus. Hope Explored is very simple really. First, we discuss together one of the big longings we all have in life for hope, peace, or purpose. Then there's a short teaching film from Luke's Gospel, which is focused on the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. And finally, we explore a passage of Luke's Gospel together in a short study. So Hope Explored is three sessions presenting the essence of the Gospel from the Bible. And what we found is that it's an appetizer for people. They go through this material and they find that they want to explore Jesus further. Our prayer is that as they meet Jesus in the pages of the Bible, they'll turn to him in repentance and faith.